And Phil Callahan is a wonderful scientist who studied effects all over the world. He's gone to the war zones in the world and measured the sound frequencies in those areas, like Yugoslavia and Middle East, everywhere, and found certain indications that when an area begins to break down, in the frequency, the soil breaks down, the climate changes, scavenger insects come in, people begin to argue and fight and things happen. And when the frequency or the, let's say, the harmonic fractal of a greater love connection is restored to the area, there's a different climate, the, the soil conditions change, the insect behavior changes, and people's interpersonal relationships change. Uh, dialing up frequencies and somehow being able to get those frequencies into a human biosystem, but not so much locking on like a digital clock and that type of entrainment, but it's a type of playing the frequency and the frequency crosses o to, over a baseline, a little to the left, a little to the right, allowing for the uniqueness that we all have. And that somewhere in the crossing of that frequency over that baseline, it'll hit certain magic moments, certain windows like Nick was talking about. And when you hit those moments, magical things would happen. Magical in the good sense of magic. In other words, um, something that reminds you of a higher level of coherence, a higher level of well-being, including diseases and other types of um, ch physical challenges and illnesses disappearing. That's all part of the same system. It's like acupuncture on the earth and acupuncture in deep space and tuning and, 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 and antennas. There are specific height with every single dimension and aspect and placement and geophysical placement from a satellite's point of view is absolutely all totally mathematically encoded. And many of the pyramidologists and Egyptologists argue as well, no, this is the correct number and this is the correct number. And it seems to me that the intelligence of those monuments and some others in the world too that aren't quite as famous or aren't talked about as much are created at such a high level of intelligence that they're like symbiotic and they, they interact with the researchers in such a way that where you're coming from you create a certain resonant field and then as you approach the monument with your beliefs and with your resonant field the monument gives back to you according to that resonance so then as you progress and I've noticed with myself as I've progressed more spiritually and opened up more in different ways I saw different things that I didn't see in earlier parts of my searches and discoveries and investigations that indicate to me or at least suggest that as I've worked on myself and changed my own resonance, that has provided a key that let different levels of the monument come to me and be understood. And along with that would come, what are you going to do with the information as part of your resonance? What is your intention? Um, where are you coming from in your heart with it? Are you trying to take the information and make weapons out of it? Or are you trying to take this information and create some kind of a, a liberation with it? in a balanced way and is it your timing to see it and all of those kinds of questions that I believe are part of our holographic field that in the use of it it is a sacred language it is a type of a transmission even my talking to you anything that I write on the board or discuss that is aligned with how the blueprints work it's a it's a wake-up call it's a it's a remembering we all have the divine right to know how these blueprints work because it's built into us it's part of our heritage Okay. That a lot of the scientists who have musical background, many of them haven't really taken their musical background into the sciences to look at it. It's almost like their, their world of playing their musical instruments, if they're in a string quartet or something like a physicist that gather and play in a brass quintet or whatever, is almost independent of their other science research. And I find that very interesting. The majority of ones that I've met were not integrating their musical life and their scientific life together. And today, more and more, I am meeting people who are beginning to do that. But still, it's like the, the clues are obvious. When you start looking around, I can show you some of the numerical resonances that relate to this, that back up what I'm saying. And they spent years looking at the numbers very meticulously and what the formulas are for them and the correspondences. And I'm finding the new sciences are beginning, new scientists are beginning to open up to a paradigm where they're embracing an interdisciplines in a, in a better way. And for me, my own particular pathway is to look at everything musically. All phenomena that I've looked at in the sciences, I've looked at from a musical, harmonic point of view. And what I've done is label things for my own, uh, in, in order to find my way through a matrix of numbers and correspondences with musical names and with musical frequencies, like 12 inches, for instance, I will label the number 12 as a G note because 12 hertz, or cycles per second, happens to be a G note. 
And I have a very meticulous numerical procedure for this so that I don't get lost in it. And it doesn't get fuzzy. It's, it's, it's very, very specific in terms of behavior of numbers and so on. But then I would label different phenomena. So then when I look at the measurements of the pyramids and other sacred sites, or look at the frequency of mitochondria or something, whatever I happen to get data on and look at it, I label it, whether it's light, sound, feet, inches, miles, pints, liquid, all musically. And as I began to do that, I began to see tremendous correspondences of, of an integrity and a harmonic flow that existed in all walks of life. And what also occurred was in looking very carefully at the measurements of sacred monuments, and there are many different studies done of the monuments, and all studies do not reveal the same information. And you can imagine the amount of books out now, on, just on the Great Pyramid alone, all claiming different types of measurements, depending on where they measured from where to where, and they don't always say exactly where the measurements were taken. And sometimes there's a little pin that's out there in the field, a little steel pin that's a quarter of an inch in width, and they don't tell you whether they're measuring from the center of the pin or whether they're even acknowledging the pin. So here's a quarter of an inch, and a quarter of an inch sometimes in some measurements is enough to give you a total different picture on what the, what the number is really saying. So it can become very tricky to sort this out. What I, what I found uh, very interesting, and this is a, a current belief I have, but I'm just kind of riding with it as I go along the journey, is I feel that a lot of the studies that have been done of the pyramids, on one level, they're all correct. And many of the pyramidologists and Egyptologists argue as well, no, this is the correct number and this is the correct number. And it seems to me that the intelligence of those monuments, and some others in the world too that aren't quite as famous or aren't talked about as much, are created at such a high level of intelligence that they're like symbiotic and they, they interact with the researchers in such a way that where you're coming from, you create a certain resonant field. And then as you approach the monument with your beliefs and with your resonant field, the monument gives back to you according to that resonance. So then as you progress, and I've noticed with myself, as I've progressed more spiritually and opened up more in different ways, I saw different things that I didn't see in earlier parts of my searches and discoveries and investigations that indicate to me or at least suggest that as I've worked on myself and changed my own resonance, that has provided a key that let different levels of the monument come to me and be understood. And along with that would come, what are you going to do with the information as part of your resonance? What is your intention? Um, where are you coming from in your heart with it? Are you trying to take the information and make weapons out of it? Or are you trying to take this information and create some kind of a, a liberation with it? in a balanced way and is it your timing to see it and all of those kinds of questions that I believe are part of our holographic field so you get pyramid researchers talking about 365.252 or 242 whatever they're referring to days in a year let's say and they will say well let's see this measurement in the pyramid shows you it's just a multiple of that and therefore the, the, the pyramid is a calendar and then they will trace the life of Jesus and others and show you by pyramid inches different things that happen. And there's a whole reality of resonances built around the Gregorian calendar. And, and the Gregorian calendar, to me, is not relating to natural cycles, like the lunar cycles and so on. To me, it's like a dream spell, a calibration that throws you off from the center of the basic cyclic activity that's influencing all of life. The three, that particular 365.242 type number. Okay. Um, as opposed to using 12 and 13 and, and variations between 12 and 13 lunar cycles and events that can be calculated and observed that regulate all aspects of our life here as natural cycles. So that's kind of what I would say more like the dream spell. Yet, nevertheless, the researcher looking at the pyramid comes in and looks at these measurements and here are everything that they'd want to know that shows the Gregorian calendar in live and living color in the Great Pyramid. Now, I can't say because, I mean, there is a math of it, and if it's done meticulously enough, it seems to show that that's absolutely correct, that this pyramid says, yes, this is a true reality, because we have been referencing to it a lot for quite a long time. So it is a reality to contend with, even if it's not based on natural cycles. And then there's other levels of the pyramid that are like an onion skin. You, you peel one off, and then here's another level underneath with a totally different understanding. 
For instance, the work that I've been doing with Wesley Bateman, he spent 30 years working on the pyramids. He writes for the Sedona Journal of Emergence, a lot of different articles, and some interesting ones uh, through Alien Eyes. He had a series, and Light Technologies Press is going to publish that book. It should be out pretty soon, where he's telepathically communicated with beings for 30 years all around the galaxy with a type of telepathy. It's not channeling. And he has that type of information. Then he published a series of four books called The Rods of Amun-Ra. And that was about the measurements of all the known measurements of the three major pyramids of Giza. Every room, every little cavity, nook and cranny you can imagine, plus a few other pyramids in Teotihuacan, Tiwanaku, and so on. Not obviously all the pyramids that exist out there, but he targeted a few essential ones and did a massive study. And in telepathing with beings off planet who have given him insights and guidance and so on, he made a series of discoveries that shows another world of the Great Pyramid. And this is a world that he and I have been working with that shows the subatomic world. The entire uh, Great Pyramid showing everything you'd want to know about the periodic table and the behavior of the elements, their wavelengths and so on. In other words, a total scientific Bible, so to speak, compendium of the world of science, including various constants that our physicists use in their calculations that, of course, um, however old you might say the pyramid is, let's take it back maybe a million years or older, that some of these scientists uh, like Rydberg and Balmer and, and uh, other physicists, um, their names might have not been known as that in an earlier time. But the physical constant that they use in their calculations, the pyramid measurements will reveal that constant. And some of the cases, the numbers that the scientists are using are, very, are a little bit different, just like the Gregorian calendar is just a little bit out of phase. And what happens, as I've, I've looked at all of those numbers, and believe me, I'm not trying to do a number on you in discussing these things. You know, I really want to get to a place where, um, in today, where you can find a place where this is user-friendly information or user-friendly inf inspiration for something. Not that you need to retain any of these numbers, but understand perhaps that in the use of it, it is a sacred language. It is a type of a transmission. Even my talking to you, anything that I write on the board or discuss that is aligned with how the blueprints work, it's a, it's a wake-up call. It's a, it's a remembering. Even if you don't work with calculators, you don't work with any kind of high level or simple mathematics other than simple things around the, your basic living, checkbooks, balancing this and that and so on, still, we all have the divine right to know how these blueprints work because it's built into us. It's part of our heritage. And so there may be some of you who, for instance, have not liked math. Uh, and that wasn't a pleasant experience in public education or other educational situations where, you know, the study of math was not really fun. And maybe others of you got to that place where you could get a high the way musicians get a high when they play music. I don't mean a substance-induced high. I mean, you know, from just playing with resonance of music and breathing and the natural playing acoustic and other instruments and rhythms and so on put themselves into expanded brain states and consciousness travels. But being able to do that with mathematics and having it not be a head trip, having it not be something where uh, the left brain and the third eye is overdriving the system in the heart and taking you off on a tangent, although it's easy for that to happen. But what I found in doing this work is a place where in studying the mathematics of the unified field, it was the same experience as composing music when I was writing on scores. With pencil in hand and writing on the score paper. Because as the numbers reveal themselves, they have personalities just like musical notes. And they talk and they're characters. And there is a divine language. And once you're open to that, when you're sitting in front of that language and watching the numbers revealing different relationships, it's like listening to a symphony. They're talking. And that's how I hear it. Like cartoon characters, for instance, you know, that are all becoming animated because of the way that I'm interacting and studying that. And I'm inviting you to open up to that possibility. Not that you're going to rush out and buy books on unified field mathematics and that's going to be late night or early morning reading, you know. For some, you know, I, I read in those books and I have my calculator there and I go back through the formulas and retrace it and see if I can understand things. And then I often substitute other formulas for the ones that they're using and I've discovered quite a few different things about uh, minerals and lights and sound and you know, the speed of light and the, and the distance, why the moon is the size it is, you know, it's a specific size and there's reasons for it and things of that nature. And the more that I got into it, the more I felt things were becoming coherent. 
and I felt a love running through my feeling. In other words, it didn't, I didn't use the numbers to create a distance between myself and reality. It actually brought it closer. Where I see this heading is, of course, taking this knowledge consciously and doing things like making music with it, putting these numbers into various kinds of machines, like the Rife machines and so on. We've taken Rife frequencies and recalibrated them with frequencies from the Great Pyramid, and, ha and there's been some very, very interesting results. There's been other experiments that have been done of like desalinating salt water using pyramid frequencies and having the salt drop right out of the water, playing one note into the water. One single note properly calibrated. And it's very interesting. You know, maybe some of you may think, well, you know, you're not really, if you're not working the math, you don't, might not have an appreciation for decimal resolution and how many points past the decimal can you deal with. But if you're dealing with tone generators, and electronic sound, and there are certain frequencies that you want to deal with, and there's a lot of decimals involved. You want to represent as great a picture of that whole as you can, relative to things that are flexing in our world, like there's wobbles in our electricity. So a lot of electronic instruments are wobbling and such, it's very difficult to pin them down to something. And in some cases, the way the resonances work, you don't want to pin it down. You want to let it breathe, and it's crossing over a baseline. A lot of the work that's done uh, in England with the uh, chimatics devices and so on for healing with sound involve uh, dialing up frequencies and somehow being able to get those frequencies into a human biosystem, but not so much locking on like a digital clock and that type of entrainment, but it's a type of playing the frequency and the frequency crosses o to over a baseline, a little to the left, a little to the right, allowing for the uniqueness that we all have. And that somewhere in the crossing of that frequency over that baseline, it'll hit certain magic moments, certain windows, like Nick was talking about. And when it hit those moments, magical things would happen. Magical in the good sense of magic, in other words, uh, something that reminds you of a higher level of coherence, a higher level of well-being, including diseases and other types of um, ch physical challenges and illnesses disappearing. And that wasn't always because you hit the number right on, it's because somehow there was a breathing. And at the same time, there's other effects where we had to have very high decimal resolution before the effect occurred. The salt water technique needed five decimal points to occur. So here's a particular number that they were working with, and until that number got to five points after the decimal, the effect didn't happen. And, it, and you could just breathe on something and have, it, have the machines wiggle at that level. Musicians cannot play their acoustic instruments and maintain that kind of decimal resolution. I mean, the, just in breathing and the acoustics in the room and their musical instruments heating up and cooling off, and there's this flexing and breathing that our reality has. So I've had to straddle this world between extremely high precision and another world of relaxing and letting things breathe to notice where the effects are. And so some of this uh, research then is to be used in benevolent ways, to go into devices that, that are being built that can broadcast frequencies to do various things. There's experiments being done now, playing frequencies to plants and growing plants at an incredible rate within 12 hours from seed to shoot, and even having dead plants being brought back to life with sound frequencies without putting strobes into the soil, simply playing the music through a simple sound system and the plants are hearing it in the room as we would. Remarkable and, and tasty fruits and vegetables um, with, you know, very juicy types of things. I'm not talking about creating some kind of aberration in a fruit or vegetable, but things that are healthy. So this is all about resonance. I, I find it, in, in my own belief and in my own work, it's that we're made out of sound and everything vibrates. Whether we know what it vibrates to and we can describe it, but everything vibrates and resonates. And things change. Not everything continues to vibrate at the same rate. There's even changes and rates of change and pulses. But the whole universe in every way is vibrating. So it's made out of sound. And then somehow in that process of creation, light occurs. In, in my own investigations, it seems like it starts with the sound, and it's the sound current that takes us back home in near-death experiences and in other experiences of completing a physical lifetime and going back to other domains is riding on sound current. I believe that that's the um, fundamental of it. So it's showing in what I'm talking about, what I've been committed in looking at, the supreme importance of sound and resonances in every way. And yet you have popular music and a lot of music that's played and sells a lot and is, is extremely popular financially in other ways 
that as powerful as sound is, I look out in the world at some of the ways that sound is being utilized. Now, I'm not wanting to say this as a judgment. It's like looking to see what is happening. What is the sound doing? What's happening to people listening to boom boxes at extremely loud volumes where the screws and bolts in the car are coming undone? And their hearing is going out. And hearing tests are being performed on people to find out what's happened. And extreme losses of hearing from driving around in a small contained environment, often with the windows up, with the sound at very loud levels. And sound intensities can greatly affect the organ functioning and entrainment. Because people go into sympathetic resonance with these entrainments. And if the signals are strong enough, that entrainment can then begin to change organ, uh, brainwave activity, and so on. Um, what Nick was talking about earlier, like taking a particular frequency and then subtracting from another one so you get seven cycles per second in order to get that alpha or theta, depending on where you, exactly you are in it. Those are called difference tones. Anytime you take one frequency and you subtract a lesser one from it. Now this is something that's incorporated into the ancient uh, instruments that have been studied from around the world. Tibetan bells, for instance. Even a single bell has more than one frequency built into it. There's a fundamental tone, essential, predominating fundamental, and then depending on where you strike the bell, in different parts of the bell, there's other effects that are all calculated into the bell. A number of years ago, there was a musical archaeological find of gongs and bells in China that were dug up that were buried in the mud. And somehow, the way this mud interacted, it preserved the metals. There was nothing that was destroyed. So they cleaned it all up and measured the bells. And then on the outside of the bells, and they've determined at least by traditional standards that these bells are at least 3,000 years old. On the outside of the bell were the engraving instructions on how to cast the bells and what the frequency should be. That they knew exactly how to do that. They didn't just make a bell and sit around for years with a file, filing it away till they could hit certain pitches. That they actually knew the mathematics and the structure of how to cast it properly. And they said in this study that there is no one in the world today with any manufacturing and scientific production that could make those bells any more accurate than they were 3,000 years ago. And that's really, really remarkable. What I began to do with those bells in this typical, if I get a study like that, is I start looking at things to see what I can discover. And I found all kinds of different correspondences uh, relating to things like in the pyramids and different measurements and so on. I'm looking at, well, what are they tuning to? Why did they tune those bells to those frequencies? And questions like, were those frequencies specific to maybe cultures thousands of years ago? Or are those frequencies still relevant to something else that is still appropriate today? that does not have to be recalibrated for our given time. Maybe there are essential things about the, the frequencies of bone. Some of them were frequencies of what human bone actually resonates to and still resonates to today by today's measurements. Uh, other ones, I believe, relate to things such as different organs and cavities in the brain and, and hormones and things in the brain that they knew about, that they knew how to access. One of the things that the Tibetan sounds are doing when they're chanting, for instance, is they are forming cavities in their mouth by the way they pronounce the words of the mantras that are a little bit different than most people how they would pronounce it, even with correct pronunciation. So they're using their, their body as a resonant temple, and I believe that's the posture that they hold. And then they're shaping their tongue and their teeth and their cavity and the way they use their air, and they're, and they're pronouncing these sacred syllables and then they're, with visualizations, guiding the sound to different parts of the brain and basically like doing acupuncture with acupuncture needles on themselves using sound and directing it to different parts of the brain like the amygdala, which is where the unconscious is, that part, glands, the pineal, pituitary, uh, hypothalamus, the medulla oblongata area here in the back around the occipital area, that they have mapped that out and are able with sound in the way they pronounce the sounds to do tonal acupuncture and open up conscious gateways. And further extensions of that also involve things like the levitation of matter using sound, creating resonant fields that cancel out the effect of gravity and so on. All done with sound. And it's very interesting to me. We, I feel it's important for us to pay attention to what is going on with sound and also what is not going on. Because it's very easy in this society to see the entertainment in music and enjoy the entertainment and the lights and the show and the dance and everything that that can be and be distracted from just 
really getting below that just how powerful the sound is and the entrainment that can happen and what can happen with the right intention in large audiences and what can happen with sound that's above our hearing. And many of the science devices and things like HARP and that that are out there, I believe that many of the people working on these things know quite a bit about what sound can do and have tapped into it. They're not published in the scientific journals, those studies, but in order to achieve certain effects that they have, they've had to know something about how the unified field dances and what dance that they want to play with it. And that that sound, I'm not in any way trying to tell you that what I am saying is more important than anything else at, in, at all. I'm just saying that I believe it is truly a sound reality. This is a fundamental bottom line point. It is a sound reality and whatever we can do consciously with sound can greatly help, including changing our thoughts and therefore emitting a different radiance that affects matter including what we tune to, what we listen to, how we play. And this kind of information can greatly affect the changes of lives of musicians and how they approach their instruments and what they tune to. I've studied um, what musicians have tuned to over the years and I, find, I found it extremely interesting, um, the changes of pitch. Uh, initially, I was very skeptical when A440 was adapted because the U.S. military adapted A440. They were one of the first to get on that. And I thought, well, what's really going on there? And it took me a while to investigate that. And so why should a country try to stabilize, in many countries in the world, the standard pitch that they're working with? One of the things you have to deal with as a musician is if you have an instrument made in France that's tuned to a certain pitch standard, the physics of that instrument are geared to resonate in a certain window. And you bring it to the United States, and here we're tuning it to A440, and in France, let's say it was 435. The instruments don't play the same. They don't sing the same, because they, the physics and the resonant windows are different. They may be beautiful, but there's a place that they just don't like take off and fly on their own. There's a zone where that can happen. When you hit the right resonances for the instrument and everything comes together, there's these magic sweet spots that happen. And it just doesn't quite happen like that. So they've tried to, and if you have like a vibraphone player, if you play it, or a xylophone or something, and you go to Europe to play in an orchestra, and you bring your instrument with you, that orchestra may be tuning to a completely different thing, and you can't play your instrument. Therefore, you have to use an instrument made in that country to go with the orchestra that's tuned to that orchestra. And this is getting crazy again. Orchestras all over the world are tuning to all kinds of different pitches. And it's not a big problem for some violinists and certainly not for vocalists. But a lot of fixed pitch instruments, it, it's really a challenge. So they got a group of people together in the late 1800s and again in the 1900s to try to stabilize that. So you could buy an instrument made in France, play it in the United States, play it in Japan, and it's, you're going to be able to have those sweet spots. And they couldn't totally agree, but the scientific world seemed to uh, go for the A440. And then in studies that Fabian Maman did of taking equal tempered tuning, which is the basic tuning structure that's been used for several hundred years and in all, most all of American popular music and most world popular musics that use keyboards and guitars relate to this type of tuning. Um, even Harleston in his reports on the pyramids and talking about uh, Teotihuacan feels that the avenue of the dead in Teotihuacan is laid out in like frets, like on a guitar fretboard moving along at the 12th root of 2, which is the half step in that tuning system. And it, it, that's not exactly the number, but it's very close and, and, and it's a non-rational number and is not necessarily what the ancients would have done because there's no way to measure it. I mean, the, the decimals go on infinitely. There's no way to chop it off somewhere and ever get the whole wave. But sometimes researchers see a number and they'll grab the closest number to that that they're familiar with and make a whole theory and belief about it. And when you see other correspondences, they show that that's not necessarily the intelligence involved there. So anyway, uh, Fabian Maman did studies on human blood, playing different frequencies to it and taking photographs, Curlian photographs and other things. And when they played A440, it formed these beautiful angel patterns and pink light occurred every time. Incredible cell rejuvenation abilities that occurred from the use of the A440. So I went through quite a journey with that one, one where I was initially skeptical when any time certain types of um, agencies decide to establish a fundamental, I, I'm very curious as to what their intention is. But it turned out in this case that R440, you can hear it in dial tones on telephones and lots of different things, that this is a very functional cellular rejuvenation, healthy frequency to be dealing with. 
And it is a very good target frequency that if the world were to rally around uh, a given frequency for their musical instruments, here's something that can actually bring people together. It's not the only example, it's just one of the many. Now, this hi historically, the, the nature of changing the fundamental pitch is a very big thing. And it, I'm going to give you an idea of how this relates to things like harp and other projects like that because I'm wanting to tie a few things together here in the discussion, especially because of interest that I'm aware of that many of you have and the nature of this gathering. So I'm basically altering the sequence of things that I'm going to talk about with the intent that I want to get into a rapport with you on those, in on those particular interests. And I'll take questions too pretty soon uh, so that I can more selectively respond to your interests. In China, the basic tactic involved in political change was as soon as a new emperor or ruler came into power, their first act with their council was to change the fundamental tone that that kingdom tuned to. That would be like saying after this coming election, they would get together and have a power and realize that they needed to change our fundamental tone that we're all relating to so that we cannot hold on to the former politics. We cannot hold the family unit together and the vibratory field that was happening with the previous belief systems. And the first place that they did throughout Chinese history was to change the tone that the musicians played in. That meant they, it was forbidden to tune to the previous pitch. Everybody had to tune to a brand new pitch and entrain to a new pitch. Now, there was different ways that they selected that pitch, but you can see the politics of changing that pitch. Can you imagine every four years or so with a new political election, all of a sudden having to change the major pitch? That means your vibraphone player that's to spend three to five thousand dollars for his set of vibes has to get a whole new set of keys every time there's a political election. Singers can change, no problem. Violin players with no frets, they can play other pitches, but some musicians can't. So everybody would have to rally around the central tone. And you look at what is the intelligence behind those central tones and why are they tuning to what they're tuning to. That's very important to look at, that type of thing. And often what happened in the political arena in China is when the emperor would speak in a relaxed tone with a certain vibration in his voice, they would find the pitch and then they would make that be the new fundamental tone. And then everybody would be tuning in sympathetic resonance with that vibratory field of the emperor. Very, very specific. And there's other things too that were used in, in this particular uh, realm of changing pitch. So pay very close attention to things. You know. so what I found often in my musical performances that increased the feeling of love in an audience is we tuned to the frequency of Venus. And, and what Venus's rotation around the Earth was. It's a very, very simple formula. Looking for this writing implement. If anybody wants to do it, there's books by Hans Cousteau called The Cosmic Octave that discusses it. But basically what you do is you take the number of seconds in whatever the cycle around the sun is, the num total number of seconds here, and you put one over it, and that'll give you the number of vibrations in one second. And then you multiply that times two to some power to get it up into the audio power. I mean up into the audio range that we're comfortable with. And you can do this with all of the rotations of the planets and the moons. And I've observed that and found these um, frequencies and things related to this in the sacred monuments. It's very, very interesting. So I did the one for Venus. Anybody wants to tune to it? It's 442.4. 459 hertz if you want to tune to that frequency. It's very easy for piano tuners to adjust most pianos up to that pitch. And what, what I was doing when I did that was I was creating uh, something else for us to reference to. And by referencing to Venus, and there's all the stories about Venus and the beauty and love and all of, all of this and everything from myth and so on. But I found with the musical groups that I tuned to that particular pitch, there was a greater love present playing exactly the same music that we'd always played. That something happened when they tuned up to this pitch. It was very, very, very interesting. And I'm not saying that that's the only one. There's lots of incredible things to tune to with it. Um, but that worked, and I've done things with, the, with other planets, and uh, you can get recordings of this music uh, done, played on an Indian instrument with a lot of overtones by Joaquin Berent, B-E-R-E-N-D-T, 
And um, his, his recordings are available from uh, Life Rhythm up in um, Mendocino, Life Rhythm Company. And they're imported from Germany. And you can hear the different sounds of the planets and what they do. Incredible things to resonate to because they are frequencies that are happening, but we don't hear them because they're so low, extremely low, below one, like 30 some octaves sometimes below one hertz, way down there. But it's still having an effect on us. And when we go into entrainment with that in a good way, by playing it and going into resonance with it, it brings out different qualities. A friend of mine, Michael Helios, was doing work with people with their astrological signs, and he would make tapes. So if you had a challenge in your astrological sign, he would put the frequencies of those aspects of astrology onto cassette tapes to listen to, and had really, really powerful results with that. It was so powerful that when he mailed his tapes out from one post office on the East Coast, his tapes were always confiscated and they didn't arrive at the destinations that created a problem for him. He tapped into something in the nature of sound. And again, the smoke screen is all of the popular music and things that let us know that, yeah, music is here and it's around in our environment. You will kind of take it for granted. But the really, really powerful things going on in music that sometimes don't meet our ears, you know, and our early conscious recognition until we begin to delve into it and see really what's going on. And that also includes the study of insects and what they relate to, like the honeybee, 14,400 beats per minute. Very interesting. Again, that 144 that you hear in a lot of the spiritual metaphysical circles and so on. And here's a honeybee beating with those sacred numbers. And there's a lot of sacred monuments tuned to those numbers as well that occur. Well, when you change it to beats per second, it's 240, and that's an octave of our refrigerators, the 60-cycle hum which is very incoherent with the way their electricity is now. But that doesn't give 60 cycles a bad rap. It's only that application of 60 cycles. So here's a honeybee basically flying along in octaves to our refrigerators. And Phil Callahan is a wonderful scientist who's studied effects all over the world. He's gone to the war zones in the world and measured the sound frequencies in those areas like Yugoslavia and Middle East, everywhere, and found certain indications that when an area begins to break down in the frequency, the soil breaks down, the climate changes, scavenger insects come in, people begin to argue and fight and things happen. And when the frequency or the, let's say, the harmonic fractal of a greater love connection is restored to the area, there's a different climate, the, the soil conditions change, the insect behavior changes, and people's interpersonal relationships change. And this also goes into a lots and lots of other areas, including the distances between cities and what their harmonics are. Everything you can think about, from our measuring systems, to what we listen to, to what vibrates, what vibrates in our cells, and exactly what the frequencies of healthy things are in our cells. These things can be looked at, can be worked with, can be uh, harnessed in such a way that good, benevolent use can be done with it to get back and recalibrate ourselves back on track. And there's a lot of things that have been slightly harmonically detuned that once you recalibrate it, okay, does this mean um, time for questions or no time for questions? Yeah, time for questions. Time for questions, okay. Okay, well, very interesting. Let me play it. That's the frequency of the coffer in the king's chamber. Does it feel okay to you? It's very interesting. Um, the mathematics of that note is, is simply an octave of the square area in meters of the floor of the, of the king's chamber. It's exactly the same number octavized. I mean, there's incredible things that are involved in these monuments. And I've been making tuning forks and things and doing work and tuning human energy fields and such with it. And to put us back in touch as like they jolt our memory and, and, and remind us of phenomena and aspects of our journeys. And that's a very good part of, of remembering and awakening. It's almost like a type of rebirthing. You hear a certain note and you haven't heard that note for 3,000 years, you know? And something goes off. It's just time for it to go off in you. There's some questions, yes. 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 These numbers are fascinating me. Uh, as an astrologer, um, I've always been amazed at why, I mean, not why, but how uh, astrology works, because I know it does. And now, can you comment on this? I mean, in a scientific way. 
Yeah, um, without taking, you know, other areas of beauty and things out of that field of study, there's certainly um, what is in the science of the movement of the stars in light and what that light does coming from these different planets and stars and beaming and, and, and making codes go off inside us based on that, how they move, the angular velocities and scientific measurements of the rotations and the spiral rotations, the sizes of those planets, their proximities. The ancients knew that information because the mathematics of that is also encoded in their monuments, which showed that they knew it at that level. To me, that's getting into another heart of the science of astrology. And when you combine that with proper interpretations and so on, I feel it's basically that is part of the music of the spheres. And these are spheres. Music of the spheres meaning spheres of consciousness. And some are literally spheres and spheroids like planets are. But the angular velocities and other movements that are in there, when you calibrate them and use the harmonics and play those back to people, incredible things happen with it. And that can be incorporated into astrology and worked with. Um, tapes and CDs can be made and also tuning forks and things to listen to to help rebalance the archetype patterns that, are there, that they're talking about. And that's one part of it. I mean, it's a very, very deep subject. You know, but I hope that that little bit may give a clue. But yeah, there's a lot going on there. You might want to read The Cosmic Octave by Hans Cousteau. It's got some very good insights in that area. Life Rhythm publishes it. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Betsy Manning in San Francisco. And um, in San Francisco, they're putting up cylinder towers um, all over the place. And I noticed that um, there's a lot of road rage. And I know I'm getting older, but in the last six months, Crossing the street, people are just, they're, they're like bees, they're out of control. Yeah. And I was wondering if that frequency from the cellular antenna would have something to do with road rage. Besides, they're using the cell phones in the car, but, yeah. but uh, if it would... They could, absolutely. No, no problem. I've noticed that, too. Increase of behaviors and different things in, in, from having less coherency and scattering frequencies and so on. And it's easy to tune to those and broadcast them so that, you know, in a matter of moments, one could go into rage from, you know, normal, you know, very casual behavior to all of a sudden totally enraged. That, those high frequencies and the extremely lows can create entrainment so quickly, it's, it's remarkable. You know, the, the tuning of all of that stuff is definitely to be considered. And then what one would need to do to counteract or to embrace it, to lessen the resistance and not go into entrainment with it through consciousness. It doesn't have to entrain one, but certainly uh, there are uh, indicators that a person may be carrying that makes it easier for them to go into that entrainment. So I believe the antidote is in our own consciousness field to create such a loving field that that passes through and does not create the entrainment and becomes transformed. And in a way, like in martial arts, and just letting the opponent fall on their, on their own energy. You know, that can be dealt with. And it can be dealt with with shapes and sacred shapes and other resonances, and even thinking different resonant thoughts. Because there's higher levels of intelligence than those frequencies. And once you tap into that type of resonance, you know, you, you're thinking and believing and radiating so differently, they don't have the same effect. To me, that's been more the saving grace of dealing with it. Because there have been times when I felt very overwhelmed by the things that I heard about what the frequencies could do. But actually your consciousness field by increasing that uh, and radiating enough love that you truly feel is so high. It's way higher than any law of the octave will ever create with those frequencies. But certainly, I believe that that's happening. And intentionally so, too. <laughs> that's my point of view on it, anyway. Hi. For years, I've wanted to try to get this healing technique that you're talking about on a cellular level um, in feature films like movies. Mm -hmm. You go watch a movie get healed. Yes. Um, some people have told me that it would be considered subliminal and therefore be illegal. Is there any way you can think of a nose technique? I don't know. To do, to do that in a, le in a legal manner? How, how can you get around, um, you know, the, obvious there's many thinking this and working on this that are in the film industry I know some of these people they're actually working on ways to do that we've been talking about it for a number of years and I've been meeting some of the people and there's ways to do it that aren't subliminal that are absolutely out in the open and very powerful 
Yeah, uh, there, there are. You know, I can you know, give you some numbers. There's people to call. And there, is, there are things being done to do that, to use sound, to use uh, other aspects of film and color and, and other technological things for that consciousness. Uh, more is known about this than you might think. And, and it is actually going on. And it's like sort of like reverse engineering it, from, but from the heart, from a different place. And so it is totally on the mark, you know, what you're talking about and doing that without going against free will and totally respecting that so you don't get those legal things, you know. Okay, yeah, I can get you in touch with some people too. Hi. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can create a whole different resonance where... Yeah, absolutely. It's that powerful. Do you believe the obelisk and the pyramid That's all part of the same system. It's like acupuncture on the earth and acupuncture in deep space and tuning and, 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 and antennas. There are specific height with every single dimension and aspect and placement and geophysical placement from a satellite's point of view is absolutely all totally mathematically encoded. The key with the Giza Pyramid is it's 31 degrees, 8 minutes, 0.8 seconds away from, G from Greenwich. Greenwich is the dream spell coordinate for longitude and latitude. It is not the way the sacred monuments. The sacred monuments revolve around the center of the Giza Pyramid, which is at the largest equatorial and polar landmass, right in the center of it. Yeah, and, and that's the 0360 point. And when you look at all of the longitude and latitude of all the sacred sites relative to that, they speak perfect harmonic language using a set of just a few constants in pi. Completely. They're long, you multiply degrees times seconds times minutes and you get certain magic numbers. And it's all coherent, including various sacred mounds. Carl Monk, that's his work in, in archaeocryptology. And he's got books out called The Code and the Initiate Scrolls and so on. And he has studied almost all the sacred monuments, any new ones that come up. The longitude and latitude and the math, it's absolutely incredible. And the uh, obelisks are part of that. The obelisk in Washington, D.C. is a functioning acupuncture needle that's up and functioning. It's in a very, spe it's in a very specific place, you know. Yeah. It's a functioning device, not, you know, and, and it functions as a monument also, which is kind of part of a, the dream spell of it, but it also has a... Yeah, exactly. Those obelisks... Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at the math, and the color wavelengths are there, 486 feet, counting the capstone, that's one of the spectral lines of hydrogen in the, in the, the blue indigo range, exactly that, that wavelength. And, you know, the diagonal cross-section of the pyramid is another hydrogen length, 2624... Yeah, absolutely. You change those resonances, and all those numbers are resonating. And so they put them in that pyramid right on the number one point, and it goes to all the meridians everywhere, radiating those sacred numbers to the field, not only for the Earth, inside the Earth, and out into space. I was curious, that's why one question was, of the three largest pyramids, the white pyramid in China, Well, there are certain angles that are different and certain measurements that are, that are different because of where they are and how they function. And all the stuff about that white one is not in yet in terms of being able to gather real... Yeah, well, the Chinese government's ordered people to do that to make them look like mounds so that it, they don't look like sacred sites. They're trying to disguise them and make them look like hills. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, not to prioritize culture as one or another, but um, you mentioned something Yes. Um, are you familiar with the Mayan calendar? Yes. And, uh, have you heard something to the effect of it being the most scientifically uh, accurate calendar you've known man? Well, um, it's in that group, and there's not just one Mayan calendar. There's a whole series of them. They're all calibrated to different things, and the mathematics is just staggering. From our base 10 point of view, and then if you look at it with another mathematical base, there's, you know, who's to say the Mayans didn't just work in base 10? You know, base 12 is a very important one also. And the calibrations and the harmonics and things, it's, it's incredible what's in that. From what I've seen and what I've been able to assimilate so far, it's just spectacular. But that doesn't mean necessarily that the predictive element must happen. You know, that certain things have to happen on a certain date because of all the free will and so on. But the other mathematics of it is, is really incredible, all the way down to the DNA and other astronomical da data. Yeah, it's a harmonic coherent system. You know, if looked at properly and how to use the calendar in, in the proper way. Yes. I hope that helps. Back to the music, um, with the healing tones and frequencies and the Tibetan uh, aspect to it. I've heard that it's possible to put these frequencies into water. 
Yes. Uh, so could you put a whole like a complex musical piece into water and you could have the same effect drink that water? Yeah, and you use caution with that. Water takes on all the thought. There's people in, in Japan and Europe now photographing the structure of water and showing the, the clustering of it and the geometries being changed, not only through play, prayer but other substances. And you need to watch that. If you put this frequencies of the planets into water in certain combinations, you could go into some very challenging healing situations. One, because of the water is the supreme element there, and what you do to structure that water, reign, and to me, reigns supreme. I think that's like one of the number one. You clean up, a couple of scientists, friends of mine, are really working on that, and you, basically the conclusion is you clean up water, you know, you're helping to restore the goddess and then all of us, and how important that water is, and how the right kinds of water interact with the phosphorus and the DNA in the body, and the electromagnetics and the function of chakras and so on. So anything that can be done to structure it, but it can also be structured with such potent stuff that it's like as it's, it's strong as the strongest homeopathics you can imagine. So what you put in the water must be done with a clear enough intent, because when you drink it and how it radiates through the body, it can actually throw you out of balance. So I'm putting that caution in there. It's a wonderful area, but it also has to be approached with a tremendous respect because of water's ability to take on any kind of resonance. It has total memory of its entire journey. Everywhere it goes, it's like a tape recorder of the Akashic Records. And when you drink it, you're drinking all the emotions and memory and everything. So it needs to be cleared and structured in a prayerful way. So thank you for that question. What happens with this still? Um, it can be structured. It has no electrical potential without having minerals in it. Okay? You know, there's various things that can be done for cleansing and so on in certain appropriate times. And there's also types of distilled water that can create problems in the body. But it can be structured with certain additives that will cluster it and make it look like snowflake patterns. And there's several scientists who have uh, uh, additives for distilled water available. Dr. Lee Lawrenson is one and, uh, and several others that I'm aware of who are structuring it. And there's 61 clinics in Japan now using structured distilled water to treat very specific illnesses. Very interesting stuff going on there. But again, with distilled water, using the proper cautions. Because the lack of the minerals in it does not give it the certain spin rates. So when it's structured properly with other additives, then those spin rates can come up. But it can also create havoc in the system and throw things out of balance. So my, my experiences I've had and with other me medical people I've interacted with is to be very cautious with how you use distilled water. And you can put out electrical fires with distilled water and, and, the, and the electricity does not run down the water, you know? When, when those big uh, PG&E things catch on fire, some of them they put out with distilled water. Very interesting. So water is a key issue and prayer and I'm working on projects with a number of people to help restore water bodies, and it's happening. There's uh, things that are being done now where they're broadcasting radionically two photographs of different areas, and the water is cleaning up. And governments in those areas are measuring it, and the water is absolutely cleaning up quickly and within hours, and they're by those standards that they're measuring. And from what I hear, as, as bad as it is out there in the water and the, and the toxicity levels, with the right harmonic implications, it can be turned around very quickly. The question is the speed at which it's turned around so that you can still create balance. And not sometimes healings can occur so quick that there's another problem. So that level of compassion must be factored into the equation. The way the extraterrestrials work with their mathematics is like one and one doesn't equal two, it equals three. The three is the third areas, all the effects that are created from the, the resonances that are factored into it. So if they created something to change the water, they would also know that there could be a problem from cleaning the water up in the wrong manner, too fast. You know, in terms of timing, so that other things can balance and breathe with it. That kind of, uh, do, do you follow me? Yeah, and, that, and having that posture to be able to make those decisions is really crucial to go to that place where you can be sitting on a technology but you are careful in how you use it so as not to create other imbalances. And the wisdom it takes to do that, you know, it's a lot of responsibility, but it can certainly be done. And it is being done in great ways, tremendous ways. I know people directly doing that and cleaning up water bodies. Okay, thank you. I'm, I've run out of time. God bless you. Thank you so much. And,